Taste of the Unexplainable by Don de Corsell. Hi. I wanted to take a break from the usual Taste of the Unexplainable series to give a special report on remote viewing. For those unfamiliar, remote viewing is a psychic technology developed over 20 years by the military, beginning in the late 1960s. In theory, it allows you to perceive any place and time with your mind. The remote viewing program later got declassified, and I first learned about it through this audiobook, written by someone on the force. It describes how the author was assigned to view a desert combat site, contaminated with poison gas and an airplane crash somewhere in the jungle. He obtained useful intelligence at these sites, and even interviewed a ghost lingering at the crash site. I was totally intrigued. I did find free remote viewing instruction videos on YouTube, but I wasn't getting anywhere with them. And when you're serious about learning something, I find it's wise to invest in a qualified teacher. Recently, I watched a four-part interview series about remote viewer and psychic intuitive John Vivanco. He and his team of remote viewers had been employed by the government, the FBI, and other large corporations, and spent time living in a Zen meditation center. So I took the course, and amazingly, it does seem to work. But it's a little different from what you might expect. It's different because your subconscious or superconsciousness, whatever, doesn't perceive through a fixed point of view like we do. It's more like a cloud of perception or omnipresence, which gives you discrete but disconnected perceptives, one at a time. These fragmented clues can often seem confusing. You'll see this in action in a moment, and it can be confusing. Just take down whatever you perceive. So let's get into it. Here's my latest practice exercise. A typical remote viewing session looks like this. You collect and write down perceptives and quick sketches along the way. When you're done, for totally blind objectives like this one, you send it in and the remote target is revealed to you by return email. No way to cheat. The session starts when you receive the Remote Viewing Target ID number, usually an eight-digit number you write at the top of the page. From that information alone, you use the techniques taught in the class to perceive the remote objective. You start using the protocol, as I guess the military would call it, to write whatever words, phrases, or sensations you experience. There's no guessing in remote viewing. Everything you write down, you've learned to perceive in some way. While most RV classes stress writing perceptives quickly and without thought, John's right hemispheric class stresses experimentation and finding what works best. Everybody is different. Personally, I find zoning into a meditative state allows me to hear words and phrases whispered in my mind. But as you're writing these things down, you don't have the slightest idea what they're talking about. Nature's Parade Go Mobile Lickety Split I wrote the word fast in parenthesis because I've heard the expression to mean move quickly, but that was just a guess. What do you think these could be describing? Everybody knows what a parade is, but I wrote Nature's parade. So does that mean animals? And going mobile and lickety split, does that mean cars moving really fast? Or how about on the next page? Whatchamacallit? Droopy drawers. <laughs> does that mean somebody's watching that's got their pants falling off their butt? <laughs> or how about these? Back teeth, bite, hose town. Back teeth and bite gave me the impression of a creature with open jaws bearing sharp teeth, and later I drew that as a sketch. I was thinking, um, alligator, 
but what's a hose town? Well, since this session is complete, let's jump ahead and find out what the objective was. Describe the fight between the cobra and the mongoose in the video. When you click on the link, you see the animal fight, and there's a link to the full video below. Okay, so now you try to match up what you've written with what you see in the disclosure video. This process takes some thought. Let's see. In this case, the words back teeth and bite gave me a clear perception, and I drew a sketch that just happens to match this part of the video. Interesting. Now how about Hose Town? Now here is where you need to think outside the box. The snake looked like a garden hose, lying in the grass a few times. So, okay, I get the word hose. That's the snake. But how does the word town work into that? Hose Town. What do I think about when I think about a town? I think about a lot of different structures. Bright in the sun, with shiny windows that glisten as I drive by. Those images made me think of a snake viewed up close from ground level. It has many different structures, and its scales glisten like shiny windows in bright light. So apparently my subconscious equated the snake with shiny windows and apartment buildings. A hose town. <laughs> wow! See how tricky this gets. So let's go back to the previous two. Whatchamacallit and droopy drawers. Really unusual descriptions for an animal fight. But when you check through the video, it shows a squirrel standing on its hind legs, and if you compare that with this photo of someone with droopy drawers, you can't help but notice the similarity. <laughs> so what's going on? My subconscious is describing things from odd points of view and with curious language. Hose Town seems like the kind of perception something very small might have looking up at the snake from ground level. Droopy drawers. Seems humorous, but again, oddly phrased. It's almost like it's translating the animal's perceptions through my mind. I'll say more about this later. This remote viewing session had many good connections with the remote objective, but the way my subconscious describes things is unusual. The first three perceptives, Nature's Parade, Go Mobile, and Lickety Split, now seem to click into the emerging picture. The snake is a cascade of linked shiny scaly compartments, a whole parade of them. Nature's Parade. Going Mobile. Well, the snake and mongoose were shown moving in the video, and that's one idea. But there's a perceptive I'll mention later that seems to indicate the snake was brought to the filming location in a basket. And Lickety Split, which I first thought to mean fast, now sounds more like the snake's tongue chattering in and out of its mouth. There's a few more here worth mentioning. Loop de Loop seems to be referring to where the mongoose's tail did a full 360, evading an attack. Hmm. Sunglasses, bright sun, and room for error. These are perceptions you can infer from the video. Since it was bright and sunny, the film crew almost certainly wore sunglasses, and certainly stayed a safe distance away from the animal fighting, thus giving themselves room for error. Now, hammer on camera on. Oh, wow, I really had to think about this one. In general, I write down exactly what I hear, including mispronunciations and words slurred together. A more precise way of saying this, hammer on, camera on. A rhyme that roughly describes a filmmaker's clapboard. 
put in front of the camera when it's on to create a loud hammer crack noise used for post-production audio video syncing. You know, the word Cameron also reminds me of the famous filmmaker, James Cameron. My subconscious must have been trying to convey thoughts about cameras, filmmaking, and production equipment, all in a two-word rhyme. Sort of amazing. And these three, mystery guest, surprise visit, likelihood, seem to be describing the two parts in this video. The first part shows a squirrel attacking the snake but later a mongoose runs in, making it the surprise guest the film crew didn't expect. Don't look back is pretty clear. After the mongoose is bitten, it runs away and does not look back. And this one, Southern Exposure, I figured out using Google. These creatures all live in Africa, south of the equator, and that equates to Southern Exposure. Now these four, again, curious wording. Later in the day, monstrosity, bow end, shows fear. The bow end of something is the pointy front, and the mongoose certainly has a pointy front. The term monstrosity I had to look up, and when I drew this diagram in the session, I was thinking of something really huge, like an alligator. But my subconscious reports, as you've seen, from unusual points of view. And from the snake's point of view, the mongoose is truly huge. A monster that's just like the definition says, outrageously or offensively wrong. So not all the perceptives I wrote down are accurate or verifiable watching this video. But if you really think about what you've written, you might uncover some other interesting bits of story. Take a look at these sketches. Some of them seem to be telling an interesting behind-the-scenes story. This first sketch shows people watching what my perceptives call a drama, a show, in the United States. Curiously, this show was filmed for the Smithsonian Museum and TV Channel which is located and airs in the United States. The flashing lights, twirling, hard base, seemingly ineffectual perceptives seem to be describing warning lights the film crew may have laid out to keep the danger away from themselves. <laughs> but apparently, it didn't work. On the second sketch, I drew someone casting a line into water. For whatever reason, I felt compelled to draw a nice little pond ripple there, but now that we know that the objective was about a snake fight, doesn't that look a lot like a snake? This gave me some ideas, and I started riffing. The crew had to set up their shots, including prodding the snake to move for the camera. Potentially, they could use a little ball attached to a line for that. If it crossed the snake's path, the snake would move. Interestingly, someone rolling a ball underhanded toward the snake may have been subconsciously related to my own interests in bowling. The film crew probably came by jeep and may have brought a basket case, the perfect way to transport a snake to their shooting location. So when we compared my remote viewing session to a video created at the target location, in more than one case, my perceptives either directly, oddly described items shown or inferred by that video, or gave hints about other things related to that documentary. <laughs> Interesting. In the second part of this video, I'll show how I arranged my perceptive clues to take a shot at describing the goings-on at that remote site. Click on the link shown on your screen to jump to part two of this video.